Well, good evening, I think, or is it late afternoon? It's a blessing to be with you all. I got two cups of, uh, is it Turkish coffee in me? Is that right? Lebanese coffee, better than Turkish coffee, right? <laughs> that should keep me going. All right, let me ask the Lord to strengthen me, strengthen us, and... Uh, bless our time together. Lord, thank you for your word that guides us. Thank you for your ability, for your spirit to interpret it, to study it, to proclaim it, to obey it, live it, and encourage others to surrender to you and to your word that we might all glorify you by enjoying you forever. Guide our time now, open our ears, our eyes, and our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm calling this message, It's Right to Use Our Rights to Glorify, or for God's Glory. You know, it's a cherished possession of many people all over the world to have freedom. Many wars and much blood has been shed to secure freedom. And those who have enjoyed the liberty to live how they want and to say what they want are quick to become angry if anything threatens those rights and freedoms. You've probably heard someone say at one time or another, I have my rights. I'm seeing at least one nod, so I'm not the only one that's heard that. In fact, even the Bible speaks in many places about freedom. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, it says, It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, stand firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. All right, so we have freedom, we have rights. However, should we always exercise our rights? Are there times that we should give them up? There are those that warn us that if we give up our freedoms, we may never get them back. Some say that while there may be times to give up our rights, doing so because somebody simply doesn't agree with our beliefs and choices is not one of those times to give up our freedoms. For example, I knew a man who uh, candidated at a church and during his, um, we'll call it his interview, he walks to the church with his wife. They decided maybe one or two steps in the door this is not the man for this church. You see, his wife was wearing pants. And in that church, that was a sin. She was not allowed to wear pants. So should his wife comply? Should she say, you know what? I'll just, we'll come and I'll just, can, maybe we can interview again and I'll just wear a dress for now on. Of course, ankle length. There are families that believe it's a sin to watch Disney movies. Should we follow their rules? Are there times to do that and that's appropriate? Or are there times to say, mm, that, that's, that's silly? I'm, I'm asking. I'm not giving answers. I'm asking you to think about these questions. For years, there have been Christians who have argued over the use of hymns versus contemporary music or the kind of instruments used in church. Some people even have drums in their church. Oh, wait, wait. I like modern music, so I am perfectly fine with drums, but I know there are people that say that's a no-no. Actually, I thought Grace Church, where the Stantons and the Ransoms are sent out as missionaries, um, I didn't think they allowed drums. I thought, oh, they're, they're an old conservative church, but I've seen drums used all throughout the church over the years. Should people leave their churches because of having different instruments? I remember my home church in the US, there was a battle over hymns. Some of the older brethren said it should be hymns only, no contemporary music. And so the, the song leader said, well, we want to be respectful of them and loving, so they did hymns, but they did the music in modern 
terms. They didn't use the pipe organ. They, those that say they spiced it up, not allowed. It has to be done, hymns only, done the way God gave them to us. That's a battle in many churches. Many people now and recently have had strong opinions about to mask or not to mask, to vaccinate or not to vaccinate. Should we comply with their desires, give up freedoms or leave churches over these things? Many churches have split over this. So these are some of the issues here we're talking about. We have rights. Do we, when do we exercise them? What's the proper use of our rights? Well, to answer this, let's start with the question, should we always exercise our God-given rights? Should we always use freedoms that do not violate Scripture? Well, the Bible addresses this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. That's where we're going to focus today. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse 23 and 24. Look at these verses with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 23 and 24. This is actually the first time I've ever written a sermon using the Legacy Standard Bible, the LSB. So it hopefully sounds familiar enough to you, but it might be a little different. Um, it's going to be very similar to the NASB, but starting in verse 23, 1 Corinthians 10, 23, and I'm going to... Forgive me, I'm going to add a few words here because I think there's an implication. It, it starts out with all things are law, lawful. You see that in your Bibles, all things are lawful? I think a good way to read it is, and this really helped me a lot, I saw this in the New Living Translation as I compared several translations. I think this is an accurate way to look at this. Paul is speaking and Paul says to the Corinthians, you say all things are lawful. But I say, not all things are profitable. You say, all things are lawful, but I say, not all things build up. Paul acknowledged that all things are lawful, that is, all things that are not forbidden by God are permissible. However, Paul added, while they may be permissible, not all things are profitable. In other words, not all expressions of our freedoms are beneficial or helpful or make us and others better off. Not only that, not everything that we are allowed to do builds up others. So yeah, we could be technically right. Yeah, we're, this is permissible. We're not forbidden in Scripture. That's not the problem here. Paul's asking or saying, look, all you say these things are allowed, but is that the best use of our freedoms? Well, to understand why Paul addresses this issue, let's look at the background of this passage a little bit. Many Jews had a hard time understanding the proper use of their rights. For thousands of years, God gave them a temporary system so that they could demonstrate the faith necessary to be accepted by him. Okay, so the salvation, Old and New Testament, is based on faith. And it's grace in both testaments. In the Old Testament, the way they showed or expressed that faith was by keeping a system called the law of God. However, at the right time, God made a new way to demonstrate genuine faith the genuine faith that is necessary to be accepted by him. That way is believing in and following his son, Jesus Christ. So the grace, that grace, freed God's people from slavery to a system. Does anybody know how many rules the Jews had to follow? So there were ten commandments. Those ten commandments were basically... Um, given examples of them. Here's the ways you can obey these Ten Commandments. 613 rules, and probably you could, there would be even more, I'm sure. But those are the ones that they chose to 
give examples of throughout Scripture. That grace of no longer being under those rules, remove the shackles of works-based salvation. It was works for those in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, who didn't follow God by faith. It was a way to show their faith for those who truly believed in him. But it was very difficult to understand for the Jews who carefully attempted to live by those laws for generations to now, all of a sudden, the Messiah had come. They're free. That was hard. Their fathers, their father's fathers, their grandfathers, and so on, for hundreds of years practiced these laws. Take Peter, for example. All his life he followed the commands and traditions that were passed down since the time of Moses. And I mentioned traditions there. In addition to all those laws, they added their own traditions as well. So Peter followed a moral code that included how he must love God and his neighbor and a civil code that included regulations on the clothes that he could wear the food he ate, the people he could even associate with, and even his work schedule. This encompassed the entire life of a follower of God. So it must have been quite an adjustment getting used to this new freedom he had in Christ. And to help him understand that freedom that he struggled with, God gave him a vision in Acts chapter 10. This is perhaps a familiar story, but in Acts chapter 10, Picking up in verse 12, as the church is newly formed and it is, the Holy Spirit is acting through the apostles and spreading to the ends of the earth, Luke wrote that in a vision, Peter saw something. Acts 10, verse 12 and following. He saw all kinds of four-footed animals, crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the sky. And a voice came to him, rise up, Peter, slaughter and eat but Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything defiled and unclean. Again, a voice came to him a second time. What God has cleansed no longer consider defiled. God was teaching him a lesson. He had a diet, a way of living. He couldn't even touch these animals or he was defiled and couldn't worship God and go to the temple, had to go through ceremonial cleansing. So he struggled with my enemies are now my brothers and my sisters. What was never on a table in my house is now all free game. People that I could not uh, marry or give my children in marriage are all fine now. That had to be rough, so the Lord gave him this vision. And just as Peter struggled with the proper use of freedom from the law, the Corinthians also struggled with that. And that's why Paul exhorted them not to be selfish with their freedom. Back in 1 Corinthians 10, 24, he commanded them, and this is a command, instead of focusing on their rights and what they are allowed to do, instead of focusing on what they can get away with or what's permissible, they should focus on how to bless and serve others. Paul put it this way, 1 Corinthians 10, 24, continuing in our passage, let no one seek his own good, but that of the other person. This verse shows us an opportunity that comes with being rescued from the law. We are freed from building the inferior kingdoms of self and are given the privilege to focus on the needs and desires of others for Christ's sake. Instead of serving ourselves and seeking our own benefit, we are commanded to practice doing things that are good for others. And these could include, I just put down a couple. I'm sure you could think of so many, but for instance, we could sacrifice our time to disciple someone else. Maybe give up that fame, Favorite television show that you watch for an hour and spend an hour discipling somebody. Or sharing our resources for the good of others. We've uh, been here just a few days and we've been enjoying the kindness of a few families. 
people take their resources and say, you know what, these aren't ours, these are God's, and I'm going to share them for God's glory. We can use words that encourage people to be Christ-like, go out of our way to say something that would build someone up, would hurt a broken heart. We can lovingly and patiently counsel others to turn from sin. This is the consistent teaching of Paul. He wrote in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 5. Some of you may have this memorized. If you don't, I encourage it. This is a great little passage. Philippians 2, 3 through 5. Do nothing from selfish ambition or vainglory, but with humility of mind, regarding one another as more important to your, than yourselves, not merely looking out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this way of thinking in yourselves as also is in Christ Jesus. So from these two verses, we can see that we shouldn't exercise our rights in every situation. Scripture commands us to surrender them if they prevent us from doing good to or edifying others. However, we should give up, should we give up our rights when someone immaturely or mistakenly believes that what we are thinking, doing, or saying is wrong? If someone says, hey, you shouldn't do that, and they're flat out wrong, they're being legalistic, Maybe they're young in the faith. Should we automatically dismiss that and say, no, I have my rights. I'm not going to let this person, you know, basically have control over the way I live. I think many Christians would say, yes, we shouldn't allow that. I remember talking to um, an, a godly older couple who led the music in the church. And uh, I'm not sure what background they came from, but... Uh, when they led the music, they just really kind of got into it. And some people really struggled with that. And so we had a discussion. They were sharing, well, you know, we're worshiping God. We don't want someone to control how we worship God and stood their ground. And I, at that point, held my tongue. But I thought, you might want to consider if you're distracting someone and hindering their worship, at least pray about maybe that's a right that you can give up for God. So here's the second question. Should we exercise our rights if it offends others? And this is covered in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 25 through 30. The problem that the Corinthians struggled with, and this is part of the background of this text, is can they eat food that was sacrificed to idols? And that's when Paul began to address, okay, well, yeah, you have freedom, but should you use it? That's the background, what you eat. While it was their right, doing so offended some and got in the way of sharing the gospel. And that's going to be the big principle there. That's the question that should drive how we use our freedom. Does it get in the way of sharing the gospel? So Paul taught in 1 Corinthians 10, 25 through 30, starting just in the first two verses, eat anything that is sold in the market without asking questions for conscience sake. And then he quotes a passage here. He says, for the earth is the Lord as well as all its fullness. Quoting from the Old Testament, Paul was able to give this command, you can eat whatever's sold in the market without asking questions of, for conscience sake. He, he could do that because he knew what Jesus taught in Mark 7, 18 through 21. He was fully aware of Jesus' teaching. In Mark chapter 7, starting in verse 18, Jesus said, Do you not understand that whatever goes into the man from outside cannot defile him? That's men and women. It's not what goes into us that defiles us because it does not go into our hearts but into our stomachs and goes to the sewer. Thus he declared all foods clean. Verse 20, and he was saying that which proceeds out of the person, that is what defiles us, what comes out of our heart, not what goes into our mouths. So the only condition that Paul gave here in 1 Corinthians 10.25 regarding the eating of meat from the market was 
You can do it, just don't ask questions about its background for conscience sake. He mentions that word conscience sake, I think about six times in this passage. Our conscience is an inner witness. It's an inner witness to our moral conduct. It is the, the faculty of the soul that distinguishes between right and wrong and prompts us to choose good and avoid evil. In verses 27 and 28, back in 1 Corinthians 10, it continues. Paul clarifies whose conscience he's talking about. Whose conscience should we be concerned about as he's dealing with the proper use of our freedoms? And so to do that, he uses a hypothetical situation. He actually gives two hypothetical situations. He said, and I, here's my words, for example, let me, let me back up a few verses and read this again. Eat anything that's sold in the market without asking question, questions for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's as well as its fullness. For example, if one of the believers invites you and you wanna go, Eat anything that is set before you without asking questions for conscience sake. So this scenario would be like, like say a coworker invited you over for dinner. Now obviously, they wouldn't be offended if you ate the meal that they prepared and set before you. It'd be kind of silly if they prepared a meal and set before you and then you bite it and they go, I can't believe it, I knew you would eat that. that that's kind of silly, right? Obviously, if they prepared it and set it before you, they have no problem with you eating it in the first place. So to that, there is no reason to ask the background of the food. Just eat it. And don't risk creating an issue by asking, oh, by the way, wow, this is delicious. Where'd you get this from? This didn't come from the, the Hindu market down the street or something, did it? He said, don't even do that. Just Eat it, don't cause any problems. Thank the Lord, it's from him. Not, it's not what goes in you that defiles you, it's what comes out of the heart. However, in verses 28 and 29, he gives a second scenario. The first one, he says, if a believer. In the second scenario, verse 28, he says, but if anyone, okay, he opens it up a little wider. If anyone says to you, so this could be a believer, now it's possible, it could even be an unbeliever. And if anyone says, wait, don't eat that. This meat's been consecrated to idols. Do not eat it for, for the sake of the one who informed you and for conscience sake. And then Paul said, I, don't, I do not mean your own conscience, but the other person's. So in that situation, someone points out that the food you're about to eat has been defiled because it was used in idol worship. And earlier in this chapter, Paul talks a little bit about the peace offerings that the Jews would offer. And he said, when they offer this peace offering to God, they give the best portions. In the Philippines, that would be the fat. And then we'd be sad to see them burn the fat, and that's the part we want to eat. Um, and then they would eat a part of that free will offering, um, a le what would be considered a lesser part, but it would show that we identify with God. We're devoted to him. And so the problem was, if someone said, hey, you can't eat that, as a Christian, and you did, in their mind, you're identifying with the idol. You're, it's like you're devoted to their gods. You can't, what's wrong with you? So verse 29 makes it clear, first of all, when he says, don't do that for conscience sake. It makes it clear that it's not our conscience. It's anyone, it's the conscience of anyone who sincerely believes that the exercise of our freedom is wrong. And whether they're right about that or wrong about that, it really shouldn't matter if we want to be gospel witnesses. We need to weigh heavily. Well, me insisting on this freedom, is that going to hurt or help the cause of Christ? We don't want to offend a well-meaning person. I think that's where I would draw the line, too. If it's a well-meaning, sincere person, if they sincerely think, no, that's not right. I can't believe you're doing that. And it causes them to stumble. That person you want to protect and be gracious to. If it's just someone who likes to be in everyone's business and it, they're not even a believer, maybe they want to control. Okay, that person you may not want, you know, 
they're not open to the gospel in the first place, and then in that type of situation, I say, yeah, I'm not going to let that person rule my life. Because people can go crazy with their own standards and rules. So there, I think there is a balance. So whether the offended person is an unbeliever or a believer, Richard Pratt says that thus, when Christians eat such meat after asking its history, their host's conscience may be encouraged towards idolatry. Oh, I guess it's okay. You know, I'm, I'm a young believer, perhaps, and that Christian's eating it. He's more mature than me. I, I, I guess it's okay. They might mistakenly think uh, that being involved with idol worship is okay. Alternatively, the host may consider believers hypocritical, hypocritical thinking, no, that's not okay, and I can't believe that he's doing that or she's doing that. They should know better than that. As Jesus said, we are free to eat whatever we want, but if there is a chance that the exercise of that right might get in the way of sharing the gospel with the lost or cause a fellow believer to stumble, then Paul commands us to give up our rights. Some of my favorite dishes in the Philippines, crispy pata, which is, I think that's the pork legs, I think, the pig legs, um, lechon is the whole pig. We love the skin. Sometimes you carry the lechon. If it's at a party, the ears are gone before you even get in the house because it's people. It's like God's potato chips. They're real crispy. We like to eat that. Well, if I had, it's funny as I'm Jewish by blood, but I, I feel I'm a part of the church and I was raised by a very secular family. But if I had a Jewish friend who really tried to follow the law of God still, I'm not going to. I'm not going to eat those things in front of them. I'm going to give up that right. Another popular dish is called dinaguan in the Philippines. It's. It's. Uh, I won't say what's the material inside, but it's made in the blood. Um, that would cause my Jewish friends to stumble. So I would give up that right, even though I'm free to do so. I don't want to do anything that would hinder the gospel. So now we come to what I believe is the most difficult part to understand in this passage. It's verse 29. It's actually two parts, verse 29 and 30. Paul said in verse 29, For why is my freedom judged by another's conscience? When I first read that, I kind of felt like he was saying, You know what, nobody has any right to ask me what I'm doing or say anything about it. Why should I be judged by another man? I'm going to do what I want. But then I felt that's a doesn't seem in line with what came before this and what's coming after it. I think the key to understanding this is the, this clause is the word judged, which means to be called into question, to be judged unfavorably, or to be criticized. So with that in mind, here's, what I, here's how I would interpret this, or how I, I think we could say this. Paul's asking, why would I risk having the genuineness of my relationship with God judged or called into question because I'm simply, um, by the way, I'm using my rights in Christ. I'm not going to let that happen. I'm not going to risk someone thinking I'm not really a sincere follower of Christ because I have the right to eat this or that. I'm going to give that up so that they don't look down on me and judge me as being a hypocrite or unloving. Or another way you could look at this is why should I let the careless use of my rights lead to a loss of rewards from God? And then Paul expressed that same idea. I think Romans 14 verses 20 through 23 back up my interpretation here. Look at Romans chapter 14 verses 20 through 23. I see that you guys use, well, I can do this. I, uh, I have it in the ESV here, but I'll go ahead and do it. I'll read it from, what is this, the, is this the right one? Yeah, the Christian Standard Bible, which is also a great translation. So Romans 14, starting in verse 20 through 23. Do not tear down God's work because of food. Everything is clean, but it is wrong to make someone fall by what he eats. It is a good thing not to eat meat 
or drink wine or do anything that makes your brother or sister stumble. Whatever you believe about these things, keep them between yourselves and God. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves. But whoever doubts stands condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith and everything that is not from faith is sin. So I just want to highlight what Paul's saying here. Don't, don't destroy God's work over something as petty as food or whatever right we might have. A little homework for you, if you're interested. The next chapter, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and I believe you, can, you could, after verse 1, starting from verse 2 and following, I think you, you could add the words in the beginning, for example, and then Paul starts talking about the right to or not to wear head coverings for women in the church. I think that's another issue of do you exercise your rights or not, and the gospel is what helps you decide when to or not to. So looking at freedoms we could give up, um, just wanted to throw out some things to think about. Here's some possibilities, freedoms that might cause someone to stumble that you could give up. Like watching televisions or movies, let me, let me add this here, with them that might offend them. I learned this years ago when I was helping in the church with uh, sixth graders. I knew at that time that God was calling me to the mission field. And so we watched a missions video about a group in Indonesia called the Taliabu, and they had witch doctors. And um, I guess they would put curses on their enemies by taking the fluid of the dead person's eye and they would mix it in. So I shared that video with my sixth graders and one of the parents was horrified, said, we don't even let our kids watch Disney movies and you showed them that. Fortunately, they were dear friends. They forgave my, my mistake. And as I taught in the first service, I, I needed to repent and be reconciled. And I did that with them and didn't make excuses. And it was neat. Their son came out as a short-term missionary to the Philippines years later. They said he was having nightmares after that, but he said he wants to be a missionary now. So God still used it. But movies that could potentially offend others, you can give it up. We don't need to announce it. Hey, I'm going to go see the new Avatar or whatever, if you know, it might cause someone to stumble. And I'm not saying, oh, you can't see it no matter what. But if you know someone else is going to stumble, just don't let them know that you saw it. Listening to certain kinds of music in their hearing. Wearing certain kinds of clothes. Partaking of some foods and beverages. Or enjoying certain sports or spending leisure time that might hinder the gospel, etc., etc. As I preached this only one other time, and a Filipino brother uh, back in the Philippines was sharing how he has a small business with some employees. And they were having a Christmas party. They were going to have some dancing. And they had one of his employees was stumbled by that. He was actually in a cult, and they weren't allowed to dance. So he says, we canceled the dancing. We didn't want to cause him to stumble. Even though we had the right to do that, it wasn't immoral, it wasn't illegal, but we didn't want to cause this person to stumble, so we gave that up. Well, here's the second difficult part in this passage. In verse 30, Paul asked, well, if, if I partake with gratefulness, why am I slandered concerning that for which I give thanks? Now, I train pastors in the Philippines and I often tell them, don't use Greek words when you're preaching unless there's two possibilities. One, you're preaching to a bunch of people that understand Greek, then by all means, use the Greek words. Or two, if the Greek word somehow helps them understand the passage, emphasizes it in a way that's helpful or um, they might be helped by doing so. So in this case, we're looking at this word slandered. Why am I slandered concerning that which I give thanks? This word slandered comes from the Greek word uh, blasphemeo. Sound familiar? I think that's one a lot of us could probably, maybe all of us, oh wait, that sounds familiar. It means to blaspheme, 
to revile, to hurt someone's reputation, smite with reports or words, or to speak evil of. So here is the question that I believe Paul raised in verse 30 when he asked, why would people slander me if I'm partaking of something with a right heart, I'm giving thanks to God. I think what he's saying is, if I understand that was given to me is God's gracious provision and I receive it with a grateful heart, then why, why in the world would anyone have anything bad to say about me? I don't, I don't think anybody will. If they see my heart and I partake of it that way, I don't think anyone's gonna have a problem with it. That's what I, I think he's saying. So far we have seen that the proper use of our rights is using them for the good of others, the edification of others. We also saw that we must not insist on enjoying our rights if that leads to offending others. And then the, the test that we should use in determining or discerning when to use them is does it help or hinder the gospel? Well, Paul caps off these three these truths by telling us the most important thing to consider when it comes to our rights. He said we should use our rights with the intention of glorifying God. So in verse 31 and then verse 1 of chapter 11, I think verse 1 from chapter 11 should be a part of chapter 10 actually, in my humble, uninspired opinion. We display how great God is when we intentionally live in ways that point to him. Paul's concluding summary in this section gives two commands. He said, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether then, after all these things he said about eating and freedoms, whether then you eat or you drink, and we really wanna notice this, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to Jew or to Greeks or the church of God. Just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, so that they may be saved. And that's what we want. We want to see people saved and rescued like we were. So we don't want to think, well, I'm saved. I'm so good. No, no. I'm an undeserving sinner that deserves hell. I always will. It's only by God's grace that he rescued me. I was dead, unable to respond. He woke me. He, he raised me. He saved me. And that should cause us, when we realize that, to want to warn others and let them know that this great, awesome, loving God offers salvation to those who believe in him. And we, we certainly don't want things like our choices, our freedoms to get in the way of that. We gotta remember, we're trying to share with people who are maybe either unbelievers and, and see our life and our beliefs as foolish or immature believers that just don't understand their freedoms yet. And we can, I've got my rights. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to admit, Americans are really big in that. I don't know about Aussies, maybe so, but Americans are just, they, they're, they're, they're gonna die for their rights. It wasn't just dietary concerns that Paul had in this passage. He commanded us to use everything we have in life to lead others to become worshipers of God. We should use things like our homes, our resources, our relationships, our experiences, and the minds that he gives us to make Christ known. Paul said, whether then, whether you do, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Um, I love, I couldn't find this one quote. I think it's in Desiring God, but I was looking through Don't Waste Your Life by John Piper. He talked about drinking orange juice to the glory of God. Has anybody read that? Does it sound familiar? A couple of you. Tremendous book, uh, Desiring God. I haven't, 20 something years ago when I read it, but I still made an impact. But you could have something as simple as orange juice in the morning. One person, one Christian could drink it and give no glory to God. Just, Drinking's done. Another person could drink and go, oh, Lord, you provided this. I'm, I'm not living under a bridge. I used, we used to do ministry to people living under a bridge. I have a home. I, I have a drink. I have food for today. This is from you. This is your kindness. Thank you. That's glorifying God. And something as simple as drinking oranges, everything we think, do, and say can glorify God if we 
really are intentional and set our minds to it. So carefully and thoughtfully use your works, your words, your walks, your talks, your leisure time, and even your daily tasks to show the world the goodness and love of God. Paul made it clear that we should give up our rights and freedoms. He said the reason why is so that many may be saved. So our goal is not just to help people handle stress and have a better life. It's these two things. First, our goal is God's glory, to spread his fame because we love him. And because we love him, we love what's important to him, so we love his people. So second, our goal should be to help rescue those who are already condemned and sentenced to an eternity of punishment and separation from God. Paul concludes with a final comment here. He said, be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. He's not asking us to do anything he didn't do himself. Paul does not ask us to do anything that Christ didn't do himself. Speaking of Jesus, giving up his rights to save us, Paul wrote in Philippians 2, 5 through 8, Philippians 2, 5 through 8, have this way of thinking in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped or, or held onto, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a slave, by being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Paul certainly had that attitude and gave up his rights for the sake of Christ and the gospel as well. He said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 through 23. So that's just one chapter back from where we're looking. 1 Corinthians 9. Starting in verse 19, he says, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I may win more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew, so that I might win Jews. And to those who are under the law, as under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without the law, as I lived as without the law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ. Why did Paul do that? So that I might win those who are without the law. That would be Gentiles. To the weak, I became weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men so that I may by all means acceptable to God save some. So I do all things for the sake of the gospel that I might become a fellow partaker of of it. So we use our God given, when we use them properly, then we use them for the good and edification of others. Using our God given rights properly, we avoid offending others. And when we use our rights with the intention of glorifying God by reaching the lost, then we are using our rights properly. John Piper wrote that life is wasted when we do not live for the glory of God. And I mean all of life. It is all for his glory. That is why the Bible gets down to the, into the details of eating and drinking. So whether you eat or whether you drink, do all to the glory of God, 1 Corinthians 10 31. We waste our lives when we do not weave God into our eating and drinking and every other part by enjoying and displaying him. So is there anything in your life, any practice, words, attitudes, activities that cause others to stumble? Think about it this week. Ask, <laughs> I have here in my notes, ask your Asawa, that's Tagalog, ask your husband or your wife, or your friends if they are aware of any. I want to make this a little more concrete. Not just thinking in your head. Ask someone close to you, a friend, someone who knows you. Is there something in my life that causes you to stumble? That hurts my testimony? Or something that you've seen that might cause someone else to stumble? If they have something to offer, prayerfully consider that. Ask yourself, does this hinder the gospel? 
If it does, then plan on how you can intentionally change your life, your patterns or practices, so that your rights are not getting in the way of someone knowing, surrendering to, and following Jesus. Lord, I pray that all of us would joyfully cast down our rights and count them as nothing but dung compared to the surpassing privilege and glory of being known by you, being saved by you, that we would not cling to anything that we claim as our own. We would recognize it's all from you and for you and that we are here to be your ambassadors, your servants. We love you. And we love those you love. They're important to you, Lord. Make them more important to us. Give us hearts of compassion. Help us to have the mentality of soldiers or pilgrims passing through this world. That we can be here on mission for you. And then we can enjoy you with others who came to know you because we surrendered our rights for your glory and we didn't hinder them from knowing you and that we can witness many coming to you and I ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.